race relations, and multiculturalism. This event tonight will be recorded um, and after uh, after the event concludes, it will be posted on the homecoming website and um, will live later on various places after um, the homecoming site is down. So please stay tuned for updates on that. If you all have questions throughout the night that you would like to hear from the panelists, please use the Q&A function so that we can ask our um, panelists the questions at the end. So they already have questions that they will answer for the first half. And Dr. Yvonne Brandon will be our moderator. She will be um, asking the panelists the questions. Um, so without further ado, I will go on to begin to introduce our panelists for the evening. First person I would like to introduce is Dr. David Hyman, class of 1972. He is a retired United Methodist clergy person living in the Williamsburg, uh, Virginia area. After graduating from Randolph-Macon, he did his graduate work at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, earning three degrees from that institution. His 42 years in active ministry in Virginia included rural, urban, and suburban congregations but most of his service was in higher education. First as a United Methodist campus minister for 22 years at the College of William and Mary, and as lead pastor at Duncan Memorial on Randolph-Macon's campus. He is married to Terry Hyman, uh, is the father of three children, grandchildren to five, and a human friend to two golden doodles. <laughs> so that we have Reverend David Hyman. Next person I'd like to introduce is Dexter Hurt. Dexter Hurt is a graduate of the class of 1994, majored in computer science. Dexter was a four-year starter and two-year captain for the YJ football team. Dexter worked for two years in the technology in technology at the Virginia State mm -hmm. Library and for 21 years as an IT project manager with Bell Technology. Technologics, I think that's how I say it. Um, he is currently a senior IT project manager with GRT Transit, a position he finds challenging and rewarding. Dexter, his wife Gwendolyn and their three children live in Richmond. Uh, an avid outdoorsman, Hurt loves to camp, fish, and hike. And to date, his and to date, he has visited 35 of Virginia's 38 state parks. A board member of the Virginia Department of Cons Con uh, Conservation, Jesus, and Recreation for the Virginia State Parks, a position he has held since being appointed by the gov by Governor Terry uh, McAfee in 2015 and reappointed by Governor Northam in 2019. In addition, Dexter serves on the Society of Alumni and newly created Multicultural Alumni Association at Randolph Lincoln College. Let's welcome Dexter Hurd. Next person we'll have is Chrissy Davis, a 1996 graduate, was a member of Kappa Alpha Theta and the vice president of the Pentelenic Council. Chrissy studied psychology at Randolph-Macon and then went on to pursue her master's at Loyola University in Baltimore. Chrissy spent many years in management consulting until recently joining Qvantis, a health tech startup special, specializing in OWL and machine learning for hospital patient flow, where she oversees a customer success division. Chrissy loves Baltimore, her five godchildren, working with nonprofit organization, Be the Bridge to Racial Unity, and until recently traveling and eating with her lifelong RMC friends. Let's welcome Chrissy Davis. Next person we have is Charlita Richardson. Charlita M. Richardson is the executive director for the Florida College Access Network. In this role, she leads the organization as, as it works towards the statewide um, sale to 60 goal, where 60% 60 of the Flor Floridian population will have a college degree or higher quality credentials. Prior to joining FCAN, 
FCAN. Um, Charlita worked for 14 years as the president and CEO of Partnership for the Future, or PFF, as many may know. Uh, direct college access and success service provider in the metropolitan Richmond, Virginia area. She has also previously worked for the city of Richmond, establishing workforce training program for uh, area high school students, as well as Capital Area Workforce Investment Board as its youth programs manager for the seven counties surrounding Richmond. Charlita holds a bachelor's in accounting from Randolph-Macon, class of 2000. She also holds an MBA in management from Sawyer University, as well as a certificate in nonprofit management from Virginia Commonwealth University. As a new Tampa resident, Charlita is excited about being able to work hard, walk her dogs in a new area and sightsee with her mother, who is also relocated to Tampa area with her. Let's welcome Charlita. And last but not least, for our panelists, we have Kayla Watts. Kayla Watts is a 2017 graduate from Randolph-Macon College with a, with a degree in psychology, sociology, and anthropology. And in 2018, she received her Master's of Education from Virginia Commonwealth University through a nationally ranked center for sports leadership program. Kayla then moved back home of, to her home of Woodbridge, Virginia, and works as a sports operation coordinator with FXA Sports, an adult sports league in Fairfax. She is a member of the Multicultural Alumni Association at Randolph-Macon College. So those are all of our panelists. And the last person that I'll have the duty of introducing tonight will be Ms. Dr. Uh, Yvonne Brandon. Dr. Brandon graduated from Randolph-Macon College with a Bachelor's of Science, majoring in Biology, and uh -oh, I didn't have her class. Okay. She later obtained her Master's of Education um, from Virginia State University and doctorate and received a doctorate degree in education from Nova University. Dr. Brenda spent numerous years working with uh, Richmond Public Schools in various roles, ranging from assistant principal onward to superintendent. Currently, she works as a consultant for Jobs for the Future, serving as a leadership coach for principals of schools in the Central Ohio Partnership for Colleges and Career Readiness Expansion. Dr. Brandon is very active in the community by serving on a number of boards. In fact, she is a member of our RMC um, Board of Trustees. So I now have the pleasure, oh, uh, before I kick it off and hand it over to Dr. Brandon, um, I forgot to introduce myself, which is something that I often do when I'm speaking to my students. Um, my name is Alicia Elms. I am the Director of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs here at RMC. So um, I will pass it over to Dr. Brandon and I will be back to speak to you all later as I will take over for the Q&A. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to serve as moderator for this conversation, the beginning conversation, on a subject that it has been thrust into the limelight uh, due to recent events in our national focus. Um, this is a conversation, though, that is necessary. It is a conversation that has to be ongoing. And it is a conversation that would help to improve our dear Randolph-Macon College for students in the future. Um, there's a book that I'd like to uh, reference and it's, uh, it's written by Glenn Singleton. And this book is called Courageous Conversations About Race. And it actually is a field guide. It is a step-by-step um, uh, -step, uh, guide on how to have these conversations that will sustain and deepen the dialogue beyond diversity. Diversity is one step, but we have to continue to talk about this. He gives four agreements in his book that will build the momentum for change and inclusivity. 
One is to stay engaged. And by that, be committed not only to tonight's conversation, but conversations in the future, as well as being committed to participate, as we know you will as alum, uh, alumni of Randolph-Macon, to improving our dear school. The second is to experience discomfort. This is not a comfortable topic. We all will uh, experience some level of discomfort and we all will say things that may be uncomfortable for others, but we have to remain respectful. And that is the key to having this courageous conversation. But we know that it's when we don't talk about these things that we create vast, vast gaps and divisiveness. We have to talk. The third point is to speak your truth. Be open about your thoughts and feelings, but respectfully. And the fourth is to accept and accept the fact that this will not be closed. It's not gonna be a closed subject with this one event. We need your patience. We need your endurance. We need your commitment to assist in having a continuous conversation so that we might uh, address our issues and come up with solutions that would not be quick solutions, but those that would endure over time. So I will start with asking a few questions um, and directing them to the panelists. We will uh, have three minutes panelists to respond. That's three minutes each. And I'll just wave my hand if you get beyond three minutes so that you can tie up your last thoughts and present them. Okay? All right, so we'll start with David. And David, um, Alicia didn't say my class, but I'm going to keep it a secret because you are from a class that graduated uh, a few years before I came to Randolph-Macon. I'm keeping it a secret because people can do the math and you'll know my age, and that's a secret that we keep forever, okay? So David, first question, or first person to respond. Describe your experiences when you left Randolph-Macon including your conversation, things that occurred during your workplace, in your environment, within your family, uh, different uh, experiences that you had after leaving Randolph-Macon. Okay, great. And I hate to tell you, but your secret's already out because it's on the screen the year that you graduated. Um, I was hoping it was too small. Oh, uh, well, yeah. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation. I left Randolph Macon with a degree in sociology, which was helpful for opening my eyes. And also left in 1972 with a, a strong memory of the uh, killings of students that took place both at Kent State and at Jackson State in 1970. Uh, one of the reasons I think this is important is because we readily remember the, the deaths of the four students at Kent State, uh, but 50 years later, even a lot of my friends who are somewhat uh, alert and caring had forgotten about Jackson State uh, that happened 11 days after, after uh, Kent State. Uh, another reason I'm glad for this conversation is that it struck me that in my graduate school education, like was the case at Randolph-Macon, I never had a person of color as a faculty member. Um, I did have the opportunity to teach part-time at Virginia Union's uh, School of Theology, where most of the students were African-American. And as I thought about it, I realized I lived in predominantly white neighborhoods. Most of the congregational life I had was in settings that were predominantly white. Uh, but that being said, for three years, I was the pastor of an all-white congregation in a racially changing neighborhood. And that congregation did benefit from a consultant who was working with congregations in such transition. And that eventually led to the congregation hiring a summer intern from Virginia Union that had a positive impact for them. Uh, and later, I served a congregation near a military base. It was about 20% min uh, minority membership and also had some multicultural leadership, which is not always the case. 
Uh, my current uh, bishop is an African-American. My previous bishop was Korean. Uh, and I had a black district superintendent at one time. And of course, in campus ministry, I worked hard in trying to maintain and make connections with various groups on that campus of all flavors. Um, and one of the great experiences of being a campus minister and also being a Duncan Memorial was having the opportunity to interact with students of color on both of those campuses. And I remember that it was only after working hard to gain and receive their, tr their trust were they uh, willing to tell their truth um, to me as a white person. Um, politically, I'll tell you, I arrived at Macon as a Republican and I left as a Democrat. Um, and a primary uh, place of engagement for me in terms of issues of justice and inclusion has been around LGBTQ uh, folks. Uh, and that really grew out of uh, my growing awareness related to race. Um, and culturally, uh, in my retirement, my wife and I have done a civil rights pilgrimage. Uh, I've been privileged to actually be able to get a ticket to the African American Museum uh, and to the Native American Museum, as well as the Holocaust Museum. And my wife and I are supporters of, of Southern Poverty Law Center and the NAACP and the Equal Justice Institute. And one of the great things about being retired is I get to read, read, read. And that's been really important for me in the last five years uh, to participate in this kind of engagement. And I'll stop now. All right, thank you, David. Kayla, can you give us uh, a response to that question? Sure. So after leaving Rudolph Macon for me, um, I went to grad school at VCU um, and I was in the Center for Sport Leadership program. Um, the focus of the program is kind of that sports are universal so that they're accessible to all different cultures, backgrounds, um, race, class, gender. My focus was in youth sports. Um, I lived in Richmond during that time, which was a big difference from the small town of Ashland after four years, um, but I loved every second of it. Um, I was in my third year volunteering with Team Excel. Team Excel is a before school mentorship program for middle and high school student athletes. Um, it helps lower income students who don't have the best support at home with their grades, with their attendance, with their community service, as well as just helping them with support and being more well-rounded. Um, I was also a volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club. We used photography to show um, how sports and activities could help lower income areas. And then I worked as a volleyball coach, as well as an assistant athletic director at St. Gertrude High School. After I graduated from VCU, I moved back to Northern Virginia um, and I became a sports operations coordinator. I worked with um, FXA Sports. We have 17 different sports, 50,000 players, um, and 150 leagues. Um, and we serve obviously the diverse clientele of the DMV area. And then I'm also part of the Multicultural Alumni Association. So that's what I do at Randall Megan. Thank you. And now we go to Dexter. Yes. So um, I kind of find it a little, little different. So when I coming to Randolph Macon, um, I, I must say I was a little naive about uh, racism. Um, growing up in a small town in Southwest Virginia, um, I played sports. So I played football, we we're a big football school. So as an athlete, you, you don't tend to see a lot of the things that happen. People tend to treat you a little different. Um, coming to Macon for me um, is when I kind of first really started to see incidents and things happen where they actually directly happened to me. Um, so when I left Macon in 94, um, I guess, you know, the world to me seemed fairly progressive. I was just ready to leave there and to get into the real world. But, you know, I had no misconception about what was out there, about, you know, what the world was like. Um, so for me, I consider myself fortunate. You know, I had a good education. I found a good job, um, a good position in life. So I was ready for anything. Um, where it hit me, I think, the most was um, in my job. Um, my, one of the jobs that I had um, in the private sector, um, you know, it was very money driven. And uh, I found that a lot of the things that happened were really subtle, um, ambigu you know, ambiguous and very personal. Um, sort of my coworkers or a boss um, or, you know, friends just making insensitive comments. Um, a lot of times the meetings and things that I were in or going to a customer, I was probably the only person that looked like me 
And, you know, me figuring, hey, man, I know what I'm doing. I got this great education. I know, you know, what I'm working on. And I had something to offer. But a lot of times we're looking back at who I was and I kind of felt that, wow, that's, you know, something's not right here. So th that was kind of my first experience with it. And yeah, I think I was kind of shocked. And um, more than anything, it was for me to learn to kind of how to deal with the situation, um, how to navigate around it. And I think it wasn't until later in life that I kind of learned that, you know what, you need to kind of step in and kind of say something about it, um, take ownership of it, and just let people know that, hey, that's not acceptable and that I'm not going to accept it. Um, I don't talk a lot about racism because I, I really don't like to allow those situations to um, define me or to, you know, just to kind of make who I am. Um, I'm a man of faith. Um, I like my character to stand for me. So, you know, my strength is what I kind of um, go by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charlita. Um, good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll actually start with, let me explain a little bit about why I selected Randolph-Macon. I attended an all black high school um, in Richmond Public Schools. And so when I chose Randolph-Macon, I chose Randolph-Macon on the premise of getting a different experience and being able to learn to adapt in an environment where truly I was gonna be in a minority. Um, so fast forward, I graduated from Randolph-Macon in 2000, started my professional career. And I will admit that, you know, my career to me, it started out really strong. Um, I didn't feel any issues, but what transpired as I later went down a couple of years down the road and realized is that a couple of things, I had two factors that supposedly worked against me. One, I was black and I was a woman. Um, and with those two factors being in place, what began to happen in the workplace is that oftentimes I was either, either someone over talking. Um, it was almost as if I was invisible to some extent. So I had to realize that I had to govern myself in a way that put me a step ahead. Um, you know, one as a, as a African American woman who, as we can see, I, I wear my hair in its natural state. Wearing my hair in a natural state, I had to be very cognizant of that as I went on job interviews um, to make sure that it could be accepted and be welcomed, um, you know, and so I would often try to hide some of that, um, you know, as I went through things and, and even as I got further along in my career and transitioned out of accounting and transitioned into the nonprofit world, what really began to happen as a nonprofit executive, I was a fundraiser. Um, I realized that as I was going into fundraising meetings and my experiences and, and, and having these conversations is that oftentimes I had people that wanted to support the cause, but sometimes they didn't want to hear it from me. And the reality is, an unfortunate reality is that I often had to take someone with me and oftentimes it was a white male that I took with me who that some of my donors had to speak to or <laughs> really communicated with and indirectly they communicated with me. Now, what that says to me is that there's a lot that needs to be changed. Um, the reality is that Randolph Macon, to be honest, prepared me for that. Um, so I never take away from that, that preparation that was given to me, but it was something that I experienced and up until very recently, um, you know, so it's a re real situation um, and it's a real reality that I've had to deal with as a black woman living in America trying to conquer and trying to succeed and trying to excel, no matter what my educational background was, no matter what my experiences are. Um, and so that's really what's been that battle um, and, and trying to find that sweet spot to make everything work hand in hand. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Chrissy, can you please share with us an answer to the question about what you experienced after you left Randolph Macon? Yes, thank you. Good evening. Um, when I left Randolph-Macon, I went back to the suburbs of Baltimore. And for as diverse as the surrounding area is, I, I lived, worked, socialized, went to church uh, with mostly white people. I certainly didn't have any close relationships with anyone of color. Um, that wasn't really any different than my life at Randolph-Macon or my life before that. Despite being in work, school, friend, family, and church circles, I was surrounded by whiteness, um, but I didn't consider it at the time. I didn't know what that was. It wasn't something I had awareness of or had to think about. I didn't consider it being part of my identity um, or, or having 
impact. And I, I moved around in my life like that until a few, few major shifts happened and caused me to contemplate and confront race and what it means in America for the first time in my life. Uh, one of those was gaining a sister-in-law who was a black woman. Um, we became fast friends and developed a close relationship. And I heard her talk about her life. Um, she shared with me that she was thinking of changing her name so that she would get more callbacks um, from employers um, so that she would have a white sounding name. And I, I thought I had never thought about that before. And she showed me facts and research and um, was very patient with me. Uh, she didn't need to be, but she was. She shared and I learned. And it really started to open my eyes to what I now see are two different Americas uh, that we experienced. Around that same time, I moved downtown to downtown Baltimore from the Burbs, and I started going to an ethnically diverse church in my neighborhood. Uh, and I lived there and, and was going to church with these folks in 2015 when Freddie Gray was killed. Um, and that's what made me question everything I had been taught about justice and equality earlier uh, in my life. I reflected on being pulled over by the police as a teenager two times with alcohol in my car and after I had been drinking and um, was allowed to call my parents and, and get off with a warning. And I, I thought this would, this would not happen to a black teenager living in Baltimore City, um, not at all. And that's when I, I learned what privilege is. Um, shortly after that, uh, I went to a talk by Latasha Morrison. She's the founder of Be the Bridge to Racial Unity. It's a national nonprofit dedicated to racial reconciliation. Hearing her experiences plus her specific call to action for white people to do something, this is our problem, and to dismantle racism was literally a call to action for me personally, late in my life, but later in my life, but uh, learning what it means to be white um, was to recognize that racism is not a black issue to empathize with, it's a white issue that I need to be a part of solving, and it's deeply rooted um, in who I am now. Thank you so much. I'd like to just go back to uh, Dexter for a minute. Uh, you spoke about having to navigate. Uh, Charlita also uh, spoke a little bit about it. I'm going to come back to you, Charlita, to talk a little bit more in detail after I speak with, uh, I give Dexter the opportunity. Talk to us about this process of navigating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, interestingly, when I started uh, my career being young, um, I was eager to you know, take on the tough opportunities to do the things that I need to do to try to advance. And I think it's harder in that sense because when things happen, you are hesitant to say something because you, you want to advance. So you don't want to be the person who starts waves or makes um, or causes the problems or be labeled as that guy. And I think a lot of times younger, I was more hesitant to say things or to go back to my boss and be like, hey man, that wasn't cool. Or, you know, why would you say something like that? And, um, but as I got older and frankly, as my career advanced, I felt I was more in the position to say something where I didn't feel my job was jeopardized or my position was jeopardized. And um, I actually wish I had done it sooner because I think depending on certain situations, you do have support, but you, you may not realize it. And in today's date and time, there are definitely a lot more support resources around compared to maybe back in the early 90s. And like I said, I would encourage people that if you, if you feel or you, you know that you're, um, if you, you're experiencing it, to definitely speak up and to let people know that that's, it's not acceptable because I think that kind of empowers you as a person also to, uh, you know, to have that and courage and uh, just to not accept what, you know, people are trying to Put on you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Charlita, would you uh, give us a little bit more information about navigation? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, Dexter's point about you do probably have more support than you realize. Um, for me, like I said, my navigation, especially in the last 14 years as, as in my career, was always taking someone with me. Um, but the important part of taking that person with me is he was my ally. And he was my ally in the room that would pivot the conversations back to me so that those who did not realize what they were doing, whether it was consciously or subconsciously, they in the end had to come back to me as the, as the recognized voice and leader in what the conversation was happening and taking place. 
Um, so I had to have my ally and, and that's the thing. So that support system has to be there and that navigate when you're navigating, um, especially when you're like as Dexter is hinting to is that when you're younger and your career can be a challenge. Um, as you get further along in your career, it can, you know, there's still ways that you still have to sometimes navigate and push through and motivate. Um, and that's why I use and depended on that ally and continue to depend on allies that will open the doors for me. Um, or make some introductions or try to be that bridge. And that's why I encourage people sometimes as we need a bridge um, to, to really foster some of the relationships. And, and that's where I think where I heard Chrissy talk about recognizing the privilege that you have. You, as, as someone who um, is white, you have to recognize that privilege and that you have the opportunity to be that bridge. And that's how I work my navigation is just really depending on those bridges and those allies and friends. Thank you. So, uh, David, in your experience after leaving Randolph Macon, were you aware of uh, when you were at Virginia Union um, at Union Theological Seminary of the fact that the African American students, or when you were in other situations in your uh, work life where there were you were introduced to African Americans in um, in the church that this process of navigation or finding allies was part of, I guess, our learned culture? Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. The reality is my world was so white. I'm kind of like Chrissy that I didn't really have to think about it. I just kind of took that for granted. Um, and at the same time, there were times that I realized that that navigation was going on. I think particularly that when I was the pastor of this church, it was in a racially changing neighborhood. Um, I could almost predict what a conversation was going to be like with, with African American folks that our church members would visit and invite into the congregation. And one of the first questions after the invitation would be, am I going to be welcome? And then the follow-up question was, am I really going to be welcome? And then the third question that was always the killer for us until we, until we hired this African-American young man as an intern was, do you have any black members? And the challenge of being the pioneer I understood was just, a bridge too far for a lot of folks. And I, under, and I understand that this was in the, the late 70s in Portsmouth, which is not necessarily, if anybody's from Portsmouth, I'm sorry, but that's not necessarily the most progressive city in, in Virginia. Uh, and so I understood that. And so that was kind of a moment of a awakening for me. But, but to be real honest, my world was so white that I didn't have to think about it, which is you know a judgment on me for not being alert enough at that point. Is that helpful? That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, Kayla, would you like to chime in? Sure. I was just going to say mine is situation is very different. Um, I grew up from diversity from the very beginning. I was in a Title I elementary school, went to a diverse middle school, high school. I was very familiar with being the only white person in the room a lot of times. Um, so coming to Randolph-Macon was actually a culture shock for me. Um, I ended up joining Black Culture Society, Diversity Council, um, and all those kind of diversity sponsored clubs um, just to try to kind of fit in. I found that it was harder for me to fit in with people that looked more like me because of my background. And I think that says a lot about the culture that Macon like presents itself with. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Okay, uh, we're going to move to question number two now. And I'd like uh, for Kayla to be the first person to respond to this question. Sure. What is, um, your, what is your reaction to the current events? Well, obviously, I think that what's going on is terrible. If anybody does understand the fact that Black unlawful black deaths um, at the hands of people who are supposed to protect and serve us is bad, and then you're part of the problem. Um, 
I think that what's happening right now opened the doors to a lot of different conversations with people who never really had to think about race. Um, I know for me, I work with, um, well, where I work, it's a small team, but a lot of them grew up in very white areas and they would ask me questions and I'm not really one that I feel like I should be the one answering those questions, but at least it's starting a conversation for people to understand that like, hey, there are different people out here. There are people who go through different things than we do. Um, and to understand that like, I have privilege because of my skin color, not because I have money, not because I have a good job, but it's simply because of my skin color, I have different privileges from other people um, in the society around me. Um, so I think that's very important. And that's one of the main things that like what's happening right now has started. The biggest thing that's different right now with this movement, in my opinion, is social media. Um, I'm able to see what's going on in California, in Portland, in Florida, in New York. Um, I'm kind of able to see other places and how they're reacting to things in real time. And it creates like a unity, like we're all together doing this one thing to help change. Um, and that's helped other people then step up and say, I can help make this change too, or I need to learn about this to make that change. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things that's happened now. Um, I actually attended one of the marches at the beginning of this. Um, and obviously it was powerful to get to walk with people and talk to people and hear their experiences. But most importantly, before we started walking, we knelt in honor of George Floyd um, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And that was one of the most powerful things I've ever done. If anybody is questioning what could have happened or how things could have happened, I encourage them to kneel and just see how it hurts your knees, it hurts your back, it hurts your legs. It's uncomfortable for everybody to do it. Um, but that uncomfortable nature is how this poor man was feeling and only part of it, obviously, because when he passed away. Um, so I think that's an important thing to do and understand that like this was very calculated and it's a systematic issue, not just this one problem. Um, but most importantly, I think the conversations around it is what has made things change. Thank you so much, Kayla. Absolutely. Oh, you revealed a whole lot. I do appreciate your experience. Um, Dexter, can you share uh, your uh, thoughts about this question. Yes, and um, you know, being a black male, um, for me, it was my initial reaction was, "Here we go again." Okay, it's not the first time; it probably won't be the last time. It's nothing new. You know, this is kind of the track record for the country that we, you know, lived in. Um, but you know, it became really personal for me because I have two um, two sons, two young men who are, you know, soon going out into the world um, to make a life for themselves. So, you know, this was scary to me because I'm thinking, okay, I got one that's starting to drive now. So what, you know, how do I explain to him um, this world that for him seems real innocent and, you know, he can do whatever he wants and the world is in front of him. But, you know, I now I have to tell him that, hey, you, you need to be careful. These are the things you need to do. Um, if you get stopped by a policeman, these are the things you need to do. Um, if you have people in your car, these are the things you need to make sure they're doing. And like I said, this, these things came really personal for me. Um, you know, I have a son, he plays football, you know, he wears athletic gear, he likes to have his hoodie on and just walking around the streets. And after the uh, young man was killed um, in the streets, just jogging, it was, you know, that's a thing I had to tell him then. It's like, hey man, when you're walking, you have to be um, aware of your surroundings. Um, it's just that whole fear of now putting a young individual on awareness that became really frightening for me. Um, and, and sad to a point that I felt now I'm taking away his innocence of, you know, just enjoying life at being a teenager. It's more of a, hey, you, you got to grow up and you got to be prepared. So it, so for me, that whole thing with all the protests, I wanted to get them all involved in it. Um, to help them understand what's going on, um, for them to see the history, and for them to start talking to their friends. Um, so when they're in situations and things are happening that they can understand and, you know, and call it out. Because for me, that's one thing I try to tell them is, hey, man, you, if you see it, call it out. Don't, don't let it just go by. Or if you see it happening to someone else, step up and be, you know, be the person to um, be able to make some change. Um, so that, that's kind of my reaction and kind of where I kind of fell with it. Thank you. Charlita, can you speak to that? 
to sure. this question, please? Um, you know, my, my initial reaction is that I was angry. I'm, I'm going to be honest. And th the anger stems from a couple of reasons, not only because of the mistreatment and the unlawful killing, um, but also I questioned and wondered why it took this long to get to the tipping point of people responding and reacting. Um, because George Floyd wasn't the first. We can name names years before George Floyd, and we can keep going back. We can go back to the civil rights movement. We can go back to all those movements and, uh, and keep moving it forward. Um, so that was my first reaction. My other thing and my other issue within this is that we need to start understanding that this isn't just a, this isn't a, an equality issue. This is an, an equity issue. This is a justice issue. And until we get to the point that we start really understanding what that truly means, and I've been really focused on this a lot lately, that equality is really all about, you know, treating everybody the same, no matter what, no matter the circumstances. But we have to understand that that means you're starting at different points in life. Equity says we're going to meet people where they are and that consider their needs in order to get there. But we need to go even further. And this is, and that's justice. We need to start focusing on systematic changes in our systems whether it's in our work environments, whether it's in our schools, whether it is, you know, in our country as a whole in politics. And so between the anger, I feel like I'm mobilized at the same time because that there's this piece where we need to start figuring out how do we move the needle in the justice and ensuring that we're getting to equal justice and addressing the inequalities that exist. Um, you know, so that's kind of where I am in this climate at this point. Um, and it's trying to find this balance of, I still have to be professional and be about real about it. We have to be professional about it too. But I also have this anger with me and everything else that's all boiled into one. Um, but it, it, it's just, I, I, I'm speechless at some points, realistically. Thank you, thank you. Um, Chrissy. Yes, and, and before I answer that, just Charlita, thank you so much for sharing that. And one of, um, something that happened at work once really was one of those moments again way too late in life that was cluing me into the fact that i had a very different experience a black woman that i worked with we were at an airport you know consultants flying from one place to the next and had all these terrible things happen with our our connection and this and that and we were going to miss a big meeting and i was like well i'm going to march up there and i'm going to tell them you know they this that and the other and she said i'm gonna let you go do that and I said, well, come on. And she said, no, I can't, I can't be the angry black woman at the airport. She's like, I, I'm not allowed to do that. You are. And I thought, oh, um, and, you know, really propelled me. Um, but anyway, with the protests, I, I was angry. I, at, at the same time, I thought, finally. So, so from my perspective, it was finally more white people will learn about and confront our history of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, blockbusting. You know, I sort of was doing that white person thing of like, oh, great, now everybody will know. And let's, you know, um, let, let's get, let's have everybody else have this out in the open and talk about it. And we'll all have a common and unified understanding of our history. Um, I was thinking we're going to move beyond this idea that racism is individual acts committed by unkind people, right? Um, that we're, we'll realize there's sy systemic racism that's ingrained in our institutions, that it's inevitable that I myself personally was socialized into this system um, as others were. And I thought hearing the personal stories would, um, that were coming out in the open about um, living as a black person in America, you know, whether you're sitting at a barbecue, you're, you have fallen asleep on a couch in a dorm lounge, you've, you're walking out the door of an Airbnb, you're in Central Park bird watching and ask someone to leash their dog that you could get 911 called. Um, I had a friend who parked her car at her sister's house with, and, and her toddler was in the car. Air conditioning was running because it was the middle of July and her sister wasn't at home yet. So they were just hanging out waiting until her sister got home. They didn't have a key. Next thing my friend knows, the police are there saying that uh, a neighbor called, a neighbor from down the street called and said there was a suspicious person and car idling in the neighborhood and that they had had recent robberies and she was reported and she said, Chrissy, this is, this is my life. Like, this is how it goes. 
Um, and I, I cannot imagine living in that world um, where I would experience any of that. So I, I don't know if things have come to a tipping point, like you were saying, Shirley, using that terminology I was thinking about as well. Um, but I did see a recent poll that showed that more white Americans today believe that there are advantages to being white than don't believe that. And it's the first time that that poll has ever had the numbers in that direction. But, you know, I'm not the person to ask if things have changed. Um, that, I, I don't know. So, but it gives me hope that that particular statistic. David, can you respond, please? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm like some of the other folks here. I'm really surprised that it took this long. Um, and I'm also, um, I have to confess that I'm just surprised at how black folks and other people of color have had to endure this and have not as much as I could imagine for myself just being public publicly outraged uh and just you know that that angry black woman or that angry black man all the time and and I know that there's there, there are consequences to that as 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 well um I wonder if this has kind of reached a tipping point because of the combination of so many in a short time. You know, the, the jogger and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, and I wonder also if the dog whistles that the president has been emitting have all combined to help people become more alert to what's going on. Um, and I'm also grateful that a difference between now and 30 year, 40 years ago is the cell phone. That now we're having to see uh, what's been going on and has been the part of folks experience um, for, for many more years than I can imagine. Um, and so I find myself really supporting the protests. In fact, um, instead of calling them protests or riots as the president calls them, I really think they're, I prefer to use the language of uprisings and acts of resistance to the status quo. Um, because like I said, I think it's remarkable that, that, uh, that they've been as peaceful as they have been. Uh, and, and I would also add as a native of Richmond, um, I think the statues really needed to come down and I'm happy that they have come down and be happy to talk about that more. Um, and generally speaking, I've, I've tried to be supportive with uh, members of the General Assembly that are still in session and talking about police reform, um, supportive of holding police accountable in a lot of ways. I'm, uh, I'm an advocate of doing away with police unions because I think they provide too much cover for bad cops and for those who also enable them. Um, and I do think we have to provide greater and alternative resources for the, for the mentally ill um, and for other policing activities that now take place that don't necessarily require police involvement. Um, the last thing I want to say is, uh, as the old person in this conversation, I know that we all are frustrated with the slow pace of change and reform. Um, and I also know that the wheels of change and justice grind exceedingly slow. I think that in addition to having conversations like, like this, perseverance and resilience are absolutely essential dimensions of change. And we can't just say, okay, we did this for three months. Now we can go back and do whatever we've been doing. This is, this is long haul. And um, I'm glad that the college is doing this and that, and, and that I get to be a part of this conversation before I'm dead. Thank you so much. Um, this question really highlighted a couple of things that I just want to summarize with. This definition uh, uh, or the distinction between equity and equality. Uh, Charlita, you brought that up, but that is so, so important in everything that we do. Uh, coming from my profession in education, it, there's always a question about resources and why resources, more resources are going to one spot than the other. And it's all because of the definition between equity and equality. I do appreciate you bringing that up. We also had a uh, someone brought up 
the uh, topic of systemic injustice. When we look at things that have happened, minor things that have happened, such as why do you need a uh, box to check for ethnicity or gender on different types of applications and different things that we respond to? Why? I have to be honest with you. When I graduated from Randolph Macon, one of the things that I didn't do was check the box on ethnicity. You have to invite me into your space to see me. And that's what I did. I've been um, a little a, a, a little bit of a rebel for a long time, but that's exactly what, what I did, honestly. Um, the other thing that came out from this question is that social justice is not an issue only for African Americans. It is all, it belongs to all of us. And we have to do something together collectively to make a difference. And you talked about perseverance and resistance, David. I mean, that's what it's going to take. I appreciate all of your comments. You were so, so on point. Kayla and uh, your experience, that was a, a, a true, um, a true statement regarding the difference between privilege and color of skin. You brought that out and I truly appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, now, third question and final question. What would you say to your fellow alumni who want to be a part of positive change for Randolph-Macon and for our country? Uh, I'll start with Chrissy on this one. All right, um, I, I would say, speaking to our uh, the allies, I would say it's our job to do something. I would ask white alumni to exercise, or excuse me, to examine their identity as a white person, um, interrogate what that meant throughout history, what it means today. Uh, we live in a society that turns race over to other people. They have race and we're just people. So we see ourselves as outside of race, but we're very much in it. And to see ourselves inside of it, we need to unlearn and relearn our history and acknowledge the role that we played on the oppression of people of color. And it's not about blame, but about identifying and accepting the responsibility to help fix what's been broken. It's uncomfortable and we can push through that discomfort that we feel around it to um, bring about a more just society and, and do good in the world. And if you don't know what to do about racism, if you're like, well, well what do I do about it? Um, my suggestion is to make a list of why. Why and how have you come to this point in your life um, to ask, what do I do about it? Um, maybe the reasons are because you don't talk about it with your white friends, you don't talk about it with your black friends, maybe you don't have any friends of color, um, maybe you're just realizing how pervasive this is in our society. Whatever that is, that's your guide. Like, that's where you start. Okay, these are the things to do. Um, very important that we're not going to understand if we don't engage um, and listen to black people. Um, start reading what they're writing, listening to their podcasts, videos, educating yourself. There's a lot going on. Um, and lastly, we have spheres of influence. So whether it's your work, uh, your school, your church, your family, um, there are opportunities to be an ally and to be um, actively, proactively um, anti-racist. Thank you. David, your response. Well, to quote Samuel Jackson, one of the first things we do is vote, damn it, vote. Um, vote for the kind of culture that you want to bequeath to your children and to your grandchildren. Um, I think another thing, those of us who are white folks have to again and again learn to see and acknowledge the ways we are privileged as white folks and with our fellow alumni and other people who are white who may be pushing back and resisting that. One of the things I think we have to do is to say to folks, 
this is what white privilege looks like when we see it, to name it for them so that they can become more uh, aware of that. Um, and I think it's not just a matter of not saying or acting in racist ways. I, I think Chrissy's right on target. We have to be proactively anti-racist uh, and we have to acknowledge the systemic nature of the racism that affects our lives and benefits us as, as white people. And that may be engaging with, with other folks. Like, Chris, if, you don't, if I don't have any black friends, I need to ask myself, why is that? Uh, and then I need to be intentional about developing uh, relationships with people who are different from me, whatever that difference, whatever that difference may be. And reading about things, I acknowledge being retired, I get to read all the time and I've learned a lot and, and uh, along the way. As far as the college is concerned, I know that there was a petition that went around among students and alumni. It seems like there are still faculty and staff who need to be sensitized to racism um, as, as, as well as other folks to be intentional about a, addressing that and working on that. Um, I was thinking about in terms of reparations that the college could make. I know that if somebody is faculty or staff, they can send their child free of charge to any other private school in Virginia. I wonder what it would do to Randolph Macon if the children of the people who serve the meals and clean the buildings also got free tuition to Randolph Macon. Um, they could live at home but it would be a way of repairing some of the systemic damage that's been a part of Randolph-Macon uh, for, for a long time. And also in addition to February and Black History Month, I think about things like the Brown Lecture. As far as I know, that has never ever had a person of color to be the lecturer. Uh, I don't know that we've ever had a person of color to do the, the big lecture series uh, that are sponsored in the fall, but to do that is just kind of part of the experience to, for alumni to, to advocate that. And then finally, I know we just finished up raising $150 million, which means that the next capital campaign is just going to be around the corner. Um, what if we made like $15 million of the next capital campaign focused specifically on recruiting additional faculty and providing specific scholarships for folks? to make it possible for, for Randolph Macon to be truly inclusive and representative of a broader population, because we're gonna to have to do that as a small private uh, to recruit faculty in particular. So that's enough for me for the moment. I'll stop. All right, thank you. Kayla. Yeah, so I actually had a couple things that I think um, could work in personal communities, but mostly are specific to the Randolph Macon community. Um, so the first one is to figure out whatever like your goal is and what you want to change and then focus in on that. You can't change everything all at once. You can't make these huge decisions and then not follow through with them. So if you just focus in on I want this to happen and here's how I'm going to make it happen and go through that list. Um, the second thing is to get involved. No matter how small you can get involved, get involved. Um, play to your strengths. So if you have no time but a ton of money, figure out a way to donate. If you have a ton of time, and no money, figure out a way to mentor or to be a part of the experiences. Um, just figure out whatever your strengths are and how you can help and then work that in. I know if you ask Alicia or Lachelle at Macon how you can help and give them like, this is what I'm good at, how can we use that? They can find something for you guys to do. Um, the third thing is talk to current students right now. I know it's easier for me because I'm a, just a couple years out, but we like to, when I was there at least, we like to see that people have made it out of Macon and this is what they're doing now. And it can be as simple as, here's a good book I read, I think this student should read it, or it can be, you know, here's my card, if you need a job after or a reference after, talk to me. Just talking to current students can help them understand that there's more to life than just what's in Macon. Um, the fourth thing is to gather friends from like your time frame at Macon and just check in on them. You know, sometimes it can be as simple as, How's your day going? Are you okay? Or did you see what happened in the news today? You know, how's everything going for you kind of thing. Um, I know I still keep in contact with a lot of people and we open those doors to conversations. And I think those conversations are very important to keep educating people outside of the walls of the classroom. Um, and then the last thing is, I think somebody already touched on it kind of, but stand up for what you see is wrong and then take action on it. 
So don't just see that something's happening and know that, oh, I'm donating money. It's okay. Oh, I, you know, walk this walk. I'm okay. I already did stuff. If you see something happening in front of you, you have to then put what you've done into action and actually do something about it. Um, you have to use your privilege wisely. Don't do anything that's going to put you in any danger. But you have to understand that, like, as a privileged person because of my race, I now need to step in and make sure that this wrong is righted. Very good. Thank you. Those were all great points. Um, Dexter, you're next. Um, and I have to give kudos to Chrissy, David, and Kayla. You guys made some great points. Um, a lot of that was what I was thinking, a lot of the same thing. Um, but I think it, it all sums up and comes down to accountability. Um, you have to ask yourself, what, do you, what are you doing to eliminate racism? Um, and be honest with yourself. Um, are you holding those around you accountable? Are you calling out individuals, policies, and other areas where you know, racism um, exists? And the big thing I think is it's understanding. Um, first step is you got to understand what's going on, understand how others are feeling, understand um, the plight that others are taking. Um, I think sometimes people just don't want to understand because it puts them in an uncomfortable situation or it's beyond what I want to do. I don't want to be in the spotlight doing, you know, talking about it. Um, but, you know, it's going to be un uncomfortable. Um, so we, we got to get used to that and get over that feeling and just have the conversations, um, do the difficult things that needs to be done. Um, the other thing is just learn. As um, everybody said, you just got to learn from people around you. Don't be afraid to have the difficult conversation or sit down with somebody and hear their experience or just to try to walk into some walk in somebody else's shoes. Um, you just got to look for ways to learn um, to truly understand. You got to put yourself out there, and experience the uncomfortable situation, see the issues, hear the problems and just feel the pain. Um, it's just like people always say, always say, are, are we, are we, is America better? Are we, have we gotten, have we grown? Have things gotten better? And I think the problem is that um, we assume America got better and made progress. You know, it shifted our focus and everybody became comfortable. And then now we realize that we really aren't as far as we, we thought we were. So for this success to really be there and to beat racism, I think, you know, we got to have a lot of people being involved and many tactics to uh, stay vigil. Thank you. And finally, Charlita, can you respond to that question? Sure. Um, you know, as, as the rest of the panelists have said, they really have summed up truly what it means. And I'll, I'll just add a couple of other points that I would like to be um, address. I think we have to be very specific sometimes in identifying the racial groups. The one thing I hear a lot of is people of color, but the reality is that there are different experiences based off of that group. A Black person may experience something completely different than a Hispanic in person. And so we need to be very clear in identifying which groups are being impacted. Um, there are some times that you can be brought, but I think we have to be clear about that. We also need to recognize that it's not about fixing the person. It's really, again, about fixing the issues, the practices and the policies and the culture that exists around. And we need to trust the evidence. The, the data is there. We're seeing the news stories. We're hearing about those, those injustices, those things that's happening. Believe it. Don't just shy away from it. Don't just act like it doesn't exist. Um, because you have to believe that data in order to be able to take action, in order to be that ally, in order to move forward. And then I think David hit on something that really was prevalent when he was talking about different actions and things that could be done, giving back to RMC. And I heard Kayla even talk about giving of your time. But if you're giving of your treasure, I don't know, the alumni office may get me, I don't know. But I believe that it's important that you can call out and give out some of your donation money to specific groups on the campus that may help impact and change those things like the multiculture. I'll tell you, when I do my gift to Randolph Macon every year, I allocate a portion not only to just a general fund, but I allocate some of this to the Multicultural Alumni Affairs Office because I believe it's important that the work that they're going to do is going to make the difference for the next group of students that's coming in. Um, and I see a question in the chat and I'll briefly say, you know, Alex, yes, I think we've come a long way as a campus. I also think that we have a long way to go. And so that's why that's been important for me personally to give some of my donation and allocate some of that to that group. 
um, because I feel like that that's how that's me taking action. And then as Kayla said, giving back of your time. So you can't shy away from the conversations. And as Dr. Brandon said, when we started the, the original session, really about those courageous conversations and staying engaged, talking about experiences, speaking your truth and being accepting. That's what it's all about. And so that's, it, you can't summarize it any better than that. Thank you so much. Um, what I heard, um, again, very salient points, giving your time and talent in order to make a difference in the life or the lives of students at Randolph-Macon also will help them to be, open up their eyes and be able to see exactly what the real world is about. Some of our students have come to Randolph-Macon from very protected environments. And Dexter, they've never had to hear the talk, okay? And the talk is that conversation that Black families have with their uh, black male children or and their siblings because we had it with my brother who's younger so they've not heard of the talk they don't even understand that the talk is necessary for survival basic survival understanding those kinds of things removing blame David that was a key point you know take the blame out of this we're not trying to say you did it or why you do what we want you to do is to be able to talk to each other better understand positions find some clarity and some points of similarity that can bind you together and keep you having these conversations um there was uh one oh believe the data don't think that the data are being collected just for the sake of collecting. No, the data tells a story and that story gives us information on where we need to focus our attention. And so I think those were very clear points that came out. Um, you guys were wonderful. I want to thank you. But I also just want to share with you what was not shared in my bio. Uh, Charlita knows this because we had a conversation about it. I came from Birmingham, Alabama, David, where you went to visit. That's where I was born and raised during the turbulent civil rights movement. My parents were very active in the movement. And as a child, because they did not believe in a lot of babysitters, we went to those movements. Reverend uh, Shuttlesworth was my pastor who baptized me, and my sisters were in our church when it was bombed. Three times it was bombed. They were in there one of the three times, and that was prior to 16th Street. So when you talk about the actions, it was not until there was a death in 16th Street Baptist Church that people started talking about changes that needed to occur in Birmingham. Um, so coming to Randolph-Macon opened my eyes in several, from several perspectives. And I learned a lot. I learned not only academically, but I learned how to present myself in different environments where, yes, I had an ally, Charlita, but I was the brains behind the ally. And so the confidence that I gained, there's no price that I could possibly, uh, no way I could value that, put a price on it, because it was tremendous. And I hope, uh, Alicia, that we will continue these conversations because I feel a, a special kindred to the panelists just by listening to them and I hope others who will either view this from the recording or our participants will uh, have share that same kindred spirit you guys are fabulous I want to thank Alicia um, Elms Alice Lynch 
Margaret Dotson, Lachelle, Lachelle Lewis is her last name. And anyone else who contributed to making this event, this night possible. This was a great event. And I say event because it must be connected to future events for us to make a difference for the lives in the lives of the, the students at Randolph Macon in the future. Thank you everyone for participating. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brandon, and thank you to all of the panelists. You all were fabulous. You, you provided so much insight, and I really appreciate the candid, um, the candidacy and being honest and really providing um, perspective on different points. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, Charlita, you already began to kind of answer the first question, but I do want to provide the panelists um, the opportunity to answer as well. One of the questions is, I'm curious if the, if the panelists think we have made progress as a college or society from the 70s to the 90s and to today. Do you feel like there has really been any change? I'd like to respond to that as, as the person who's been connected to the college longer than anybody else. Um, I started Randolph Lincoln in 68. There had only been African American students on campus maybe four or five years uh, prior to my arrival. Um, the fact that we're having this conversation is huge. Uh, the fact that there are a broader diversity of African-American students. I'll, I'll confess that almost all of the African-American students who were on campus when I was there were athletes. Um, and so, and I think that students are becoming bolder in naming their experience. Sometimes when talking to an old person like me when I was at, uh, at Duncan Memorial, it took a while to build the trust. But man, when I listen to the stories of, of uh, black students as late as 2015, it was really troubling to hear that Randolph Macon still was not the hospitable, welcoming place that I experienced as a white man. Um, so we've made progress, but I don't think God's finished with us yet. And so we've got a way to go. And I'm glad that we're on this journey together. David, um, when I came to Randolph-Macon, there were only 13 African-American students. Um, and my class was the second class of women. Right. So we had double issues. Um, and some of the things that were highlighted in that um, survey troubled me as well because we've come so far but we've not made the progress i i believe that i expected and i see this as being this particular uh conversation that we are having and um the commitment uh that uh, our president and administrators and faculty and staff um have made to making a change as being a positive step, but it's going to be a long journey. And I hope that we're all committed to being a part of that journey. I think that's why we have to put money where our mouth is. I mean, Jesus said your, your heart's gonna be where your treasure is. Um, and I think when we begin to invest seriously I mean, like we've got all these new programs like for the uh, the show choir and all this and yet the gospel choir is still treated as a club um, to be able to say we think this is important or we think it's important that there be more black people in senior positions of leadership and not just in the multicultural affairs aspect or to have faculty and because that's so competitive we're going to have to put money there because Randolph Macon can't compete um, on his own good looks uh, with other places that have already made those financial commitments to recruit faculty. 
David, you speak such um, good points, and I, I agree 110% that we do have to really just follow it with some money um, behind it. And I'll tell you, I was always, as a student at even at Randolph-Macon, I would always say, you know what, my dollars spend here just like everybody else's, and so I should be treated just like everybody else. I should have activities that cater to some of my interests and some of my desires as a student. Um, and I know that students still feel that way today. Um, you know, and even as you're saying, looking at the faculty and having additional leadership there, that that's going to be critical and key to the components to force students to feel comfortable, for students to feel like they're able to fit in and able to relate. You know, the saving grace for me is I had someone on campus that I could depend on and go to because honestly, I was ready to transfer because I felt lost. And I'm sure that there are some students that have felt that way, mm -hmm. but you, they're going to, they're going to require, luckily they have an Alicia, they have a Lachelle, but they can't just have an Alicia and a Lachelle. They can't just have those faces in the crowd. There need to be other faces in the crowd, you know, and I know Randolph Macon's come up again, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And I encourage you as if you are able to give, and, I, and trust me, I'm not, this is not the plug, they didn't pay me to do this, but I'm a fundraiser at heart. If you're able to give, then give to those areas where you're passionate about and where you want to see an impact to change on campus. The school needs it. And I think some of those allies also have to be white folks. Absolutely. White definitely, folks definitely. We're stepping up on behalf of others. And I'm kind, of, I'm kind of like um, Sharlita. I, I was kind of in that same boat. I think the big thing is uh, support resources. Um, because when you are African American there and something happens and you don't know who to turn to, to for help, I think that's very frustrating and discouraging. And like her, I was after incidents happened, I, I was ready to go. Because it's not something I was used to. It's very uncomfortable. So without strong support systems and resources and that people know where to go and for people to say hey we're looking out for this this is not something that's going to go unresolved uh, here um I, I remember an incident when i was there that we, we sat down with the um, president at the time and you know tried to have a conversation about what was going on and what we saw issues with and that seemed like what, what we said what we did what we did all died right there and that kind of thing is frustrating as a student there, when you spend the time to tell you, look, this is what's going on, I tell you my story, and you just turn a blind eye to it, or you feel like that's what happened. Um, so I, I definitely commend Alicia, um, the work you're doing, and I've even heard students there say it, talk about how great you are in the program there, um, you, the group that you um, support. So I think we need more of that, and kind of like David said, we need more um, faculty of, uh, of white people that are also there to support and to say, look, I support you, I'm here for you, um, anything I can do. From my perspective, I just wanted to add, I, I think that um, there are likely tip of the iceberg things that don't occur on campus. For example, when I went to school there, a fraternity had a yearly party on a plantation where the men dressed in, in uh, Confederate uniforms and the women dressed in, you know, plantation gowns. I was one of those people. I hate talking about it, but I do because it's important. Um, and I'm sure that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but that's the tip of the iceberg, kind of like in America, when you think about the KKK or like white supremacy rallies, right? That's, it's like overt in your face. Everybody knows that's bad. Well, not everyone, obviously, but it's what's below that, that I, I wonder and ask about. And that's why I'm on, um, wanted to be a part of this group is, you know, kind of getting below the surface to um, inherent bias and, you know, what does the leadership look like and, and those, those issues that are persistent and never going away and get overshadowed by the tip of the iceberg stuff. I was trying to stay in the panelist role, but I have to comment. Um, Chrissy, you brought up a great point of you participated in the activities of being on the plantation, going to the parties. Change is slow. So changes happen, but it's slow. And not everyone is always aware. And so it's happening, 
And we have to figure out a way to provide an update to folks of when it's happening so that they can know what the changes are. Because we always talk about whether or not, does history matter? or does it not? And sometimes if you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going and you don't know what you're sitting in. And so those are the activities that we no longer have on campus. But that doesn't, because that doesn't happen, doesn't mean that some of those remnants are not still on campus to where students still are struggling to find their place. They're still struggling to feel a difference on campus. So you're absolutely correct. All of you all have spoken so much about the day-to-day the -day experiences that our students have had. So many of them want to transfer, but then they there's something that keeps them here because they really enjoy their academics. Um, and so one another question, this is leading into another one. Um, actually, before I say that, if you all have questions, please use the Q&A um, feature so that we can ask your question because we do have another one. I was asked a question personally, um, not on the chat, is how would, from the alumni's perspective, how would you all encourage faculty um, and administration to have conversations about this without it being divisive? Okay, I guess I'll look, I'm gonna jump in and try to wing this a little bit here. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think that the way that you have to have the comment, we've talked about being open and honest. Um, and so that's the first start to having that healthy dialogue and healthy conversation. Um, we also have to recognize that there are truths and everybody's going to speak their own truth and have their own opinion, their own perspective. Um, and it's okay to hear that. It's okay to be reflective of that. And it's okay, as long as when those truths are, are being, you know, discussed, as even as Dr. Brandon said in the beginning, it's about being, you know, recognizing that there's respect there. Um, you know, as long as we're showing, as faculty and, and administration is showing respect to one another, as they're going through those dialogues and conversations, I think that that will open itself and lend itself to a, a safe space, because that's what you have to create in order for those conversations to occur, in order for that change to, to move forward. Um, you know, I know that we used to have a lot of diversity conversations, even not just amongst the faculty and staff, but even amongst the students when I was on campus. And that was 96 and two, 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 until 2000. Um, and so I think that that's where you bring that in. But the faculty, the staff leadership have to accept the example, because if they're not setting that example, then how can you expect the student body to have those open, safe conversations or dialogue? And respectful conversations and so some they may even have to have those conversations as administration and leadership in front of students sometimes so that the students can see and learn from that process of how it's supposed to be done and then we can move forward as a whole yeah, there might be some foundational work to happen as well like when i joined that be the bridge group there was this 101 and it was like learning terminology and basics and what is white identity, white privilege, white supremacy, blah, blah, blah. And it was the purpose of that, like Latasha created that program so that white people can come to the table and not think that talking about race is automatically divisive. You know, it's a conversation about something that is the very air we breathe. Um, and so when I think about that, like if you're in an arena where you think you're going to walk into something that's charged like that. Maybe there's, maybe there's, maybe that's starting somewhere else needs to occur first. Just a thought. And I just wanted to add to that. I mean, part of the reason we go to college is to have uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> and if we're not going to do it in, in college, when are we going to do it? And part of what I think faculty and staff have a responsibility to students to do is to show you can do this without your head blowing off. Um, I don't know, maybe you start off with that terrible episode from the office where Michael oh. is doing the, the cultural sensitivity and you're just like, oh, stop, stop. Um, but this is what we're supposed to do, I think. And, and so we're doing a disservice to students if we don't have that conversation um, and show that you can be uncomfortable and still live another day. I agree with David. I think there's a difference between 
being uncomfortable and being divisive. And I think a lot of times these conversations are just uncomfortable and we consider it to be divisive rather than just saying like, I don't like to have this conversation, so I'm gonna make it a problem. And I think that's where the line needs to be drawn. Um, but also if any faculty or staff wants to go to meetings or set up meetings with like diversity council or BCS, I know that they're willing to do that. Um, and that might be a good place to start so you can learn the language, get comfortable with the students and kind of understand where they're coming from before bringing it to your whole class. I, I, was, I guess I'll just add a little part too. I think people just have to realize it's, it's not an attack. And I think that's kind of where it's got to start. It's like, this is not an attack on any race or person individually that people are just trying to fix a problem. So by explaining and sharing my story, it's really just trying to help you to understand what's going on. And then from there, maybe we can work together to fix a problem. Not, I'm not looking for you just to fix it. It's like, I'm willing to put in just as much work as anyone else. And uh, like I said, it's about listening. I, it's surprising how, like I said, as a college environment that nobody wants to listen. And it's just gotta listen, I guess. I, I don't know, it, it just blows me away sometimes to think that this is a problem on college campus. Well, thank you all for sharing. Um, absolutely correct that sometimes we, we just have to listen and be and be ready for honesty and to engage in dialogue such as we did tonight. So I want to thank each and every one of you all who served on the panel um, to There's be here tonight. Question. We are out of time. Okay. Um, we we want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, so we thank you for being present. We thank you for utilizing your voice and, and speaking up about this topic tonight. Um, Dr. Brandon, we thank you for serving as a moderator. And we, and we thank you all for participants who are being here tonight for asking the questions and, and for staying tuned in for the entire time. And we thank you all for who may watch this and view this later. Um, so before we head out, I want to toss it over to Alice to talk about some of the updates that we may have that we have coming um, <clears throat> with future events. Well, I'll echo what Alicia said and everyone else. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for this honest conversation. And I think so many of you, all of you made excellent points, listening to one another, um, coming from a place of empathy and seeking equity. And I can tell you without hesitation that everyone with whom I work at the college is committed to this, from the president to the board on down. And good progress is being made. And I look forward to seeing you at other alumni programs. We will continue candid conversations about other issues in addition to issues around race, um, dealing with the opioid crisis and, and others in the coming months. And so I encourage you to be on the lookout for programs related to this issue and related to others so that we can have those conversations in a safe place where we can support one another and learn. Continue that education that you all gained at Randolph-Macon and continue that education of your mind and your character together. Thank you all. There, there are many ways for you to be engaged. Uh, Lachelle and Alicia mentioned, or Alicia mentioned, and Lachelle works with the Multicultural Alumni Association. They will be sponsoring events throughout the year, so be on the lookout. Make sure we have your current contact information. And um, the, uh, the college is going through uh, studies with the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities. That's something that the president and the trustees have committed to. And I know our very able alumna, Yvonne, is helping um, the college through um, those exercises and evaluations. And so we'll be reporting to you all on, on that progress. So um, thank you. Thank you for being here and on a, on a Friday night but here to discuss something very important. Have a good night. Bye everybody, thank you so much.